professor in the machine learning department uh, School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, he's been there since 2012. Uh, he is, uh, he's got his master's in uh, applied mathematics in 2001 and PhD in computer sciences in 2007, from, uh, both from the University of Etwish, Laurent University in Hungary. Uh, his interests are both in theoretical uh, aspects of artificial intelligence, machine, machine learning, uh, statistics, information theory, graphical models, uh, Asian methods, and complex data sets, as well as uh, their applications to bioinformatics, uh, medical data, neurobiological modeling, cosmology, speech processing, computer vision, and robotics. Uh, he recently received the Distinguished Paper Award from uh, IJKI in 2015 and uh, an Academic Career Enhancement Award from Yahoo in 2012. Uh, he's also reviewed for 18 scientific journals uh, in machine learning, statistics, and uh, artificial intelligence. A senior program committee member for AI Stats, NIPS, and IJKI. And a uh, grant application reviewer for NSF, the Research Counseling and Council of Canada and the European Research Council. Uh, and since 2012, he has been awarded over 10. Can everyone hear me or should I? You, you can also take it off if you want to hold it, you can. Petro, you can hear me well, right? Very good. Rogers, the one that says presentation. So the plan for today is that I'm going to talk about density functional estimations and some applications. Please, if you have questions at any time, raise your hands, and then I'm happy to answer those questions. Uh, I don't know much about your background, so please, that's why it's important. If someone gets lost, please just raise your hand, and I'm happy to answer questions. If something is all well known, just let me know, and then I'm happy to skip those parts. Sometimes I randomly switch to Hungarian, and I don't notice, then maybe raise your hand and <laughs> Time to switch back to English. All right, so any questions, just let me know. So this is my ultimate goal that I would like to achieve. I don't know how many more years it is, but I would like to create a scientific assistant that could help scientists in their life. That should be a machine learning agent. Um, that could be a collaborative agent to that level that if it works well, then you want to put the name of this system to your paper as a co-author. Okay? So that's the plan. Instead of just running you know, standard algorithms, it would be an interactive agent that would chat with you, talk with you, and help uh, decision making in your scientific areas. So how uh, so, what I, uh, so how science, traditional science works is that scientists have to make decisions about everything, what kind of experiments to run, what kind of data to collect, how to analyze those data. And what I want to do is to create machine learning system that could help you in decision making in all of these uh, processes. So these systems uh, should be able to find uh, anomalies in the data set, help making automatic dis uh, discoveries, find interesting events in your data set, or find scientific laws based on your data set, scientific laws that we don't know. So that's the plan. These systems should recommend you experiments to run based on historical experiments. It should recommend you what data to collect, or recommend you algorithms how to analyze this. Data. So that's the ultimate goal. Um, we are working on all of these parts, but it's a good question when it will be an ultimate system. Uh, the other thing I also want is uh, that this system should also teach scientists about the discovery. So instead of just running a black box model, they should be able to help our understanding as well. And here are some domains that I'm working on. Most of my time, actually, these days, I'm spending on questions in astronomy and cosmology, which is lots of fun, because for me, it's fascinating to see that we don't understand our universe at all. 
And uh, I'm also working on computer vision, robotics, uh, chemistry problems, and now this is I'm also working on machine learning in agriculture, where we built a robot, and this robot is going to these it's called sorghum fields, and try to predict properties of the sorghum, how tall they will be end of the season, and the ultimate goal is to create recommender systems to breeders, where this recommender the systems will tell that hey next year you should cross this plant with that plant to get something that's bigger. All right, but uh, today I'm just going to discuss subset of this research, and the first question I want to discuss with you is why we are all here. And my answer usually for that is that we are because we are curious. We are curious about our universe. We want to understand how the universe and nature works. We want to build machines and robots that can also understand the universe. We want to understand our planet. We want to understand the human brain and the human body. Uh, these are our goals. And to answer these questions and solve these problems, our main tool that we are doing here is always the same. That we collect data and we want to learn from that data. That's what we are doing in machine learning, and I believe most of you that's what you are doing. So we want to collect data and we want to learn from data. The issue is that the work is extremely complicated, and we have to understand complex relations across the data. <coughs> and we should be able to un answer very basic questions about the data at least. Some basic fundamental questions is how random is the data that you collect? That is how large is its entropy? How large is the dependence among the instances that you collected? How large is the mutual information between different features of the data set that you collected? Or if you have multiple data sets from different distributions, then how close these data sets are together? Or the, in other words, how large is the divergence between two distributions? Uh, these questions are generally quite difficult and very important, and to be able to answer them, we need good entropy estimators, dependence, divergence, mutual information estimators. And uh, statistics and information theory already define some quantities to measure uh, these terms. So, for example, to measure how random is a data set, we can use entropy, uh, such as the Shannon entropy. To measure how different two distributions are, we can use the Kullbacher divergence defined by this quantity that P and Q, these are density functions. And to measure the mutual information, we can use the Kullbacher divergence uh, between the joint density of some features and the product of the marginal <coughs> distribution. So these terms have been defined. And some people later generalized these terms even further. For example, Rainey introduced the Rainey alpha entropy. Again, it's a uh, generalization of the Shannon entropy, where alpha is a parameter. And if alpha is converging to 1, then the Rainey alpha entropy will converge to the Shannon entropy. Uh, the Rainey alpha divergence is defined by, defined by this quantity here. Again, if alpha is converging to 1, then it will converge to the Kullbacher divergence. And the Rainey mutual information is divided by, defined by this term, which again is the Rainey alpha divergence between the density and the product of the marginals. And Chissard, in the Chissard, who was the student of Alfred Rainey, generalized uh, divergences even further, and that's for that divergences. Um, so there are these terms, and now the question is, okay, but how can I estimate these terms? And that's what I would like to discuss uh, with you quickly. To see how import important these quantities are, I just want to show you this paper, which fell under the board. The title is Mutual Information is Critically Dependent on Prior Assumptions. Would the correct estimate of mutual information please identify itself? So even the authors put the title of their paper that, hey, we need good mutual information estimators. So how I get in interested in these questions that I was working on independent component analysis problems. And it turns out that mutual information is a very important quantity in independent component analysis. 
And my teacher was uh, in Regisa back in Hungary. And he's quite famous in information theory. He even got the Shannon Award. We know that we need to estimate mutual information to solve uh, independent component analysis and for entropy, at least. So I asked him, how can we estimate entropy? And he said, we don't know. And you know, I was shocked that in information theory, these quantities have been, decide, uh, have been defined 60 years ago, and we still don't know how to estimate them. And so many algorithms use, uh, use them. So I got interested in, in the estimation problems. So how should we estimate them? So the setup is that we have some sample points from densities. How can we estimate these quantities? So for example, let's keep our life simple here, the entropy integral P of P. How would you estimate these quantities? So you have n sample points from P. You need to estimate integral P of P. Right, so the naive way is that you build a histogram to estimate the densities P. See, you will have an estimated uh, p hat, and then you plot this p hat here, and then you have an estimator for these entropy terms. The issue is that when you are working on high dimensional spaces, then density estimation is very difficult. It suffers from the curse of dimensionality, which means that you have more data points, you would need more dimensions, you would need exponentially more data points to get the good and, uh, density estimation. So the question is, can we estimate these quantities, the entropy or full vector divergence of mutual information, in a way without estimating densities? Right, and that's what we are going to discuss how to do that. So, so we want direct estimators that can avoid density estimation. Right, so indeed one way is to build a histogram or you scatter them. Density estimation, or you can even use Kane estimation for density estimation, but I want to avoid density estimation. And that's what I very quickly just uh, want to discuss with you: how to use, how to develop estimators for entropy, mutual information, and divergences. And then we will use some, we will see some applications of this one. Okay, so formally our problem is that you have x1, x1, x2, xn, i, i, the points from the density f, and I want to estimate this quantity, the linear term, which is defined by this expression. And uh, here is one possible estimator. So let x1, x2, xn, again, be sample points from a distribution with density f in a d-dimensional space. And uh, what we are going to do is that we fix a k integer number, that k could be anything, 2, 3, 4, whatever you like, and we are going to use k nearest neighbor based density estimations. So k nearest, sorry, k nearest neighbor, neighbor based estimators. So for example, if these are your sample points, then for each sample, say xj, I calculate its nearest neighbors. If k is 3, then this will be the 3 nearest neighbor points. And then I build the k nearest neighbor graph, that's what we just did here. Okay, so on the sample point, these are my sample points, I build these k nearest neighbor graphs. And then I calculate the length of this nearest neighbor graph. Okay? Everybody's okay with this so far? So these are the sample points, I calculate this nearest neighbor graph. There, um, again, xg is a sample point. V are the points in the nearest neighbor of xj, and I calculate the sum of these distances. That's the length of the nearest neighbor graph. Okay? Actually, instead of that, what I'm going to do is that I put these distances to the power p, and then I calculate this length term where I sum the distance is distances to the power, Euclidean distances to the power p, where p 
is just this expression d minus the alpha, d is the dimension, I want to estimate the alpha entropy. And then interestingly, you can prove that this quantity here, one over one minus alpha log, the length of the nearest neighbor graph defined, divided by this term where beta is a universal constant, divided by n to the alpha, you can prove that this is a consistent entropy estimate. So the interesting thing here that I would like to emphasize is that we don't do any density estimation, and we have a quantity that is a consistent estimated of the entropy. So if you have bigger sample size, it will converge to the entropy. Right, so we can prove that this estimate is almost really uh, consistent, and we even have some rate results. We know how fast these entropy estimators are converging. If you are interested in the details, then after this talk, we can uh, discuss that. Just quickly discuss why this estimator is consistent. One thing you can notice is that the larger the entropy, the longer the k-nearest neighbor of graphs are. So, for example, here you have. We have two sample points. These uh, guys, they are uniform samples from, a, samples from a uniform distribution. It has higher uh, entropy, and you can see that the lengths of these nearest neighbor graphs are longer than the entropy is smaller. So that's one thing that we can use. And the other thing that we can use is that there's a so-called quasi subjective property of uh, nearest neighbor graphs. The quasi subjective property says that if I have n plus n sample points, and I break this uh, sample set to two parts. One sample, one part has n sample points, the other part has n sample points. Then the length, when I have n plus n sample points, is smaller than the length of the n sample points plus the length of the n sample points. So that's called quasi subjectivity. And um, if that holds, then when you normalize the lengths of the graph with M, then you can prove that this limit, there's a finite limit. And uh, this is how you can prove that normal normalization of the length makes sense. The difficulty here is that in our case, this passes subjective property doesn't really hold, but holds is that uh, you can prove that the length of M plus N points is not bigger than the length of M points plus the length of N points plus uh, small term delta. And because we have this small term delta, instead of normalizing with n, what we have to do is to normalize n to the alpha. And this is okay, it's alpha. So, yep. so do you double count the points, the distances? Mm, uh, right, so what we do is, so you, I broke the sample points to two parts, m points here, n points here, and I just count the edges between built on n points and built on n points. And what I'm not counting is these edges between these two guys. And then you can prove that if you uh, would calculate the graph on n plus n points, you would get this expression. When you, I calculate on n points, I get this expression. When I calculate, I get this expression. But I ignored some edges. That's why I have this delta guy here. And then you can prove that this is So this is how we can estimate uh, entropy. And now the question is, how can we estimate mutual information if we have a good entropy estimator? Okay, everyone is familiar with mutual information? Right, so mutual information measures how dependent random variables are. You have random variable x, you have random variable y. Are they dependent or independent? And mutual information is a quantity no non-negative quantity that can measure like this. Uh, I have two random variables x and y. They have a joint density x, y.
All right, and uh, <coughs> the Riemann mutual information is defined by this quantity that the density is F. This is the joint density. This is the product of the marginal densities. We already know how to estimate. I just told you how to estimate the linear tensor, which is this guy without this term. And now the question is, if I know how to estimate the linear tensor, how to estimate this four guy? So I would like you to think a little bit about that. So I know how to estimate this expression. How can I estimate this expression here? That again, fi xi is just the density of the marginals. So one thing that trick that we can use that you can prove if you have random variables x and y and you monoton transform x and y with the monoton transformation, then the mutual information doesn't change. The other thing that we can notice, if the marginal densities are uniform distribution, then these are all ones. And then this guy disappears. And I know how to estimate this guy. So now the question is, if you have x and y random variables, how can I monoton transform x and y such that they will have uniform distributions. I know if I monoton transform x and y, that won't change the mutual information. Exactly, right? So, uh, so we can use uh, the CDF to transform these points. I just formally wrote the uh, piece that we already discussed, that uh, if I have x1, x2, x3 random variables, I monoton transform with g1, g2, g3 transformations, I get new random variables z1, z2, z3, and the mutual information between x1, x2, x3 is the same as the mutual information between the transform points. If I could use uniform transformation here, then this guy disappears, and I already know how to estimate the entropy, so I know that uh, the mutual information between the transform points is the same as the negative entropy of these points because the margin has done So the question how to, what is that monoton transformation that leads to uniform um, transformation? And as you said, we know probability, from probability theory 101 that if xj is a continuous distribution, then if I transform xj with its own CDF, then xj will have uniform distribution. And that's, by the way, that's called chocolate transformation. Um, a little problem that we don't know the CDF, but you can estimate that's very easily from the sample point. Um, and another observation that we can make that uh, when you calculate the empirical CDF, you don't exactly know the, the values of the sample points, just the rank statistics are enough. So we are going to build an estimator that doesn't use the exact values, it will just use the ranks of the points. So we copy the empirical CDF <coughs> for each marginal. We transform the points with the empirical CDF, and uh, <coughs> that's, again, that's called the copula transformation. And uh, then the other. Everyone knows Sklar's theorem, or no? So Sklar's theorem says that. Uh, Every distribution, every multiple distribution, so for example, here you can see the distribution between x and y. You can uh, think of this distribution as the marginal distribution of pi and the marginal distribution of x, plus a so called copula distribution that couples the marginal distribution, the two marginal distributions x and y. And when you calculate the points x and y with their CDF, then you got this couple of distribution. So these were the original distributions x and y. You transform pi with its CDF, you transform x with this CDF, you got this couple of distribution. And if you estimate the entropy of the couple of distribution, then the negative entropy of the couple of distribution is the original mutual information between x and y. Okay, so it's a very important trick that if you want to estimate mutual information, you just transform your points with CDF. You got a new distribution between 0 and 1, and you just need to estimate the negative entropy, and you are done, you estimated the mutual information between x and y. 
And uh, this is also a normalization trick. So, so, so quite often people normalize just making the distribution standard normal, like um, subtract the mean and make it having variance one. Some, some, in some applications you shouldn't do that. What you should do is to normalize with the CDF of the variables that to have uniform distribution of the marginals and it's quite applic some applications that are much better. All right, and uh, we also know that if the original distribution, original random variables x and y, they were independent from each other, then this popular distribution will be just a uniform distribution. So if you want to really measure the dependence between x and y random variables, um, transform that with their CDF variables, you will get the new random variables between 0 and 1, and you can measure the entropy there, and that will tell you the mutual information. All right, so based on that, we created an estimator, and we proved that the estimator is consistent, that is, if you have more and more central points, this copula-based uh, mutual information estimator converges to the true mutual information. One caveat, we have only proof when the dimension is bigger than three, so bigger than two. And that's quite interesting, I think, that we don't have proofs and the dimension, the random variable is two or one, but when the dimension is big, then we know that the estimator is one percent. But I think we have some data results for as well. Uh, the other important thing I want to mention is that because you, you only use rank statistics, these estimators are robust to outliers that can be very important in some science applications. So for example, if you just think of the mean, what is the empirical mean? Sum x1 dot 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 xn divided by n, it's not robust to outliers. If you just change one of the sample points to the quantity, the, empiric the empirical average can change a lot. It's not true in this case because we just use rank statistics. If you just change a few points in the sample sets arbitrarily, it will not affect the estimator arbitrarily. All right, and we have some data results on uh, these guys as well. All right, so so far we know how to estimate entropy and mutual information. Another quantity I want to mention to you is how to estimate divergence between um, between uh, div uh, distributions. So the formal setup is, you have x1, x2, xn sample points from a density t, and y1, y2, ym sample points from uh, density q, and you want to know how far these are from each other, p and q. Okay, and uh, we will measure that with this linear alpha divergence between p and q, which is this expression, one over alpha minus one log integral p to the alpha q to the one minus alpha. So you can prove that this quantity is non-negative and it's zero if and only if p is q. That's called linear alpha divergence. The special case of this is the kullback elder divergence. And uh, I just want to quickly show you the estimator that looks like this. So we have some sample points from uh, distribution p, some other sample points from distribution q, I want to know how far these two distributions are from each other, P and Q. And uh, again, we are going to use K in the is density estimator. So K is 2. <coughs> and here is how the estimator works. Uh, for each point Xi, I calculate its say, second nearest neighbor. So for this point, this would be its first nearest neighbor, this is its second nearest neighbor. And I will just need the distance between xi and its second nearest neighbor. And that distance is denoted with rho to, to y. Okay, I also need the second nearest neighbor of xi among the red points, the sample points from density q. It's, this is the first nearest neighbor, this is the second nearest neighbor. And I denote this distance with nearest to. All right, so again, row two is the distance of the case nearest neighbors of xi among x1, x2, xn, and ki is the distance of the uh, x from xi among the points in y1, y2, y. And 
So estimate the range alpha, divergent, the only difficult term is that I denote with d alpha is this integral p to the alpha q to the minus alpha. So our goal is to calculate integral p to the alpha q to the minus alpha just using the blue, blue points and the red points, the sample points from p and q. Okay. And uh, this is the estimator that we came up with. So we already, so this d hat alpha that uses n sample points from p and sample points from q is defined by this uh, empirical average of these expressions. We have n sample points from p and sample points from distribution q. D is the dimension. Again, k is a fixed number, say 2. We are going to use second nearest neighbors. And you do that for all points in the sample set. And gamma is just the gamma function. And the interesting thing here is that you can prove that this d hat alpha, if n and m is going to infinity, it will converge to d alpha. Again, a nice thing here, we don't use density estimation at all. And you can prove as you have more and more sample points, I will know how far these two distributions are from each other. Okay. So bottom line is, what I, the message I wanted to show, don't start doing histogram estimation or other kinds of density estimation because that won't work for you and you base your sample complexity. This is very simple, you just have to calculate k nearest neighbors, and this is a simple statistic that you can use, and you will know how far distributions are. Yes, questions? How is the okay uh, Very good. So, what we know is that for any given piece k, the estimator is constant, and so far it seems that the best one you can do is just fix k to be 1, and that will be good enough. Uh, only have only you consider the first nearest neighbor. But empirically, it seems that it just work, works fine. Now, what, what dimension did you want? Because I imagine if, if the samples are right. high dimensional, then the k equal to 1 basically. All right. So, how about the dimension? We can prove uh, if the density of P and Q they are smooth enough, which means that V over 4 times differential zone then the convergence rate will not depend on the dimension. You will get the parametric dimension, a parametric convergence rate, um, which is minimum optimal. One caveat, though, is that when we prove convergence rate, usually we use big O notations. That means that in the big O notations, there are some constants. And those constants might be exponential between D. So you don't suffer from the rate-wise, from the cursor dimensionality, but there are some constants that constant that doesn't depend on sample size, and those might be very big. So that theory, the convergence is independent of the number of k, k and n, right? It always, with any k, you just... With any k, you have that, yeah. yeah. And it's unbiased. Asymptotically unbiased, and the variance is going to zero. Sometimes with those uh, estimators, uh, you get negative values. Mm -hmm. like you get unrealistic values. Yep. How sensitive is your method? Uh, <laughs> uh, so with divergence estimators, if you look at this, the values are always non-negative because I'm just going to use non-negative okay, values. This here. one is fine. This one is fine. The the mutual information estimation, for example, that's true. It's funny that you can get negative values as estimated values, and it happens in our case as well. So then you need to cut it. What we know is that as you increase the sample size, it will, would come back to the right quantity. So there is some kind of an uncertainty. Exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. there. Yep. And I, I got a question about the entropy as well, this alpha one over 
one by itself. But right. you get Shannon without the ghost. To well, count, yep. How do, you, how do you actually estimate Shannon? Right, so what people do in practice is that you just choose an alpha that's very close to one. But that's the good question is how you should choose alpha as a function of the sample size. Mm -hmm. And we don't know that. Okay, so it's basically for high alpha you'll get good estimators, but to the first, if you really, really want um, Shannon's, then it's But up. the other thing is that quite often you don't want Shannon. It's um, by Shannon, right? So okay. Other entropies might just work as well. And we all found some applications in computer vision that uh, with alpha 0 0.8, we got better results than with Shannon entropy. Okay. All right, to save some time, I skip some tools, but if you are interested, then we can uh, discuss uh, some proof ideas with me. But another thing I want to mention is how we can use these tools for independent component analysis, uh, independent subspace analysis. Everyone knows the cocktail party problem here? Please raise your hand if you know the mic and skip. Or, yes. Okay. Good. Okay, so let's skip to save some time. Um, there are tons of independent component analysis applications and how we can use entropy and mutual information estimator for ICA. It's, um, Notations that we don't need. So the notations we have some hidden signals S, I mix them with A, I got A, X, A times S observations. And uh, the goal is that uh, I'm observing X, I want to find a W matrix such that when I multiply W with X, then Y will reconstruct the original independent signals S. And uh, what happens is that I assume that the original independent signal, that the components in S, they were independent from each other. When I mix them with A, they will be dependent. I want to find a W that will make them again as independent from each other as possible. And uh, how can I measure how dependent those components of bias are? I can measure their mutual information. So the cost function is the mutual information of the mixed signals y1, y2, yn. And I want to find a w that will minimize this mutual information. So I need a good mutual information estimator. And then I need to minimize that mutual information estimator in w. And that's what we do in one part that I just told you how to estimate mutual information. That can be the cost function here. And then you just need to minimize that in w. Another interesting thing is, though, that um, <coughs> Everyone knows whitening in independent component analysis here. So after whitening, you can assume that this mixing matrix, so W, that's bottom normal matrix. And because of that, you can prove that uh, this mutual information cost function is equivalent to minimizing uh, the sum of the entropies of the coordinates. OK, the proof is here, but Everyone is okay with that, right? So that's another cost function in, uh, in independent component analysis. That you just have to minimize the sum of the entropies of your mixed variables. And you can prove that in the global optimum, they will become independent from each other. So if you don't want to estimate mutual information, you can just estimate entropies and sum them up. The nice thing of this, that if you look at this mutual information, problem. It has m variables. So even if all of them are one-dimensional, it's an m-dimensional problem. By here, if all of them are one-dimensional, it's just all of them are just a one-dimensional entropy estimation problem. And that's easier than estimating things in m dimension. A nice thing here is that these guys actually can be multi-dimensional. So in generally independent component analysis, you assume that everything is independent from each other. But we can assume that uh, not all the components are one-dimensional. These could be multi-dimensional. But each multi-dimensional block is independent from each other. But itself, in the multi-dimensional block, the coordinates are dependent from each other. And that's what we call independent subspace analysis, or sometimes multi-dimensional independent component analysis. <laughs> all right. So if you want to solve independent subspace analysis, you just need a multi-dimensional entropy estimator. 
and I wonder that it showed you how to estimate multidimensional entropy, you just need to minimize that. And that will solve this multidimensional independent component of the principle. <coughs> Another thing I want to mention that uh, when we estimate mutual information, I told you that it already uses strength statistics. Because of that, you can create a robust estimator. And uh, we use an estimator that's somewhat similar to that I just presented. And here I'm just showing, comparing different independent component uh, uh, analysis algorithms, such as fast IC, radical kernel IC, and J. When I corrupted mixed components with um, some outliers, and what you can see here that this algorithm that based on random statistics much more robust to corruption. So this is the, the biases is how well we can recover the original mixed components. And this is much more robust, our algorithm is one to outlier noise than all the other algorithms. So if you feel like that in your data set there might be outliers, then use rank-based mutual input estimators or rank-based, rank statistics-based dependence estimators. So the rank statistics that we use is when you do this empirical couple estimators. And I just want to demonstrate the independent subspace analysis algorithm with these uh, figures. So here I had three sources. They were A, B, C, and you can think of these images as density functions. And um, I sample some points from A, B, and C independently from each other. These independent sources are denoted with S1, S2, S3. And um, I mix them with the mixing matrix A. Then I got this mixture. And the goal is that observing these mixtures, I need to reconstruct the original A, B, and C just from these mixtures. Quick question, why they look like Gaussians? Central Met theorem says that if you mix independent random variables, they will look like more like Gaussians. And here I just want to show our algorithm how it works. So here you can see mixed components. And now I try to minimize the sum of the two dimensional entropies. components and then finally got back the original independent components. But you can notice that I cannot recover the rotation in each subspace, but the sub in subspaces got separated nicely. You can also do that for higher dimensional cases. So in this case, we had three dimensional objects. Here you can see the three dimensional independent sources. I had six of them. I mixed the six three-dimensional independent objects. So I got this mixture. So it's an 18-dimensional problem. And our algorithm was able to, just making, using these observations, we were able to separate these six three-dimensional components. So I'm just using three-dimensional, two-dimensional components because it's easy to visualize. But we, in practice, we went up to 50-dimensional subspaces. And we were able to solve that problem. Correct. So, multidimensional entropy estimations and multidimensional mutual information estimators can help you to solve independent component analysis or independent subsystem analysis problems. Another uh, thing I quickly want to mention that you can also use these problems to generalize machine learning algorithms to complex objects. What I mean on that that most machine learning algorithms, what they assume is that you have some feature vectors, finite feature vectors, and then you want to do classification or regression or whatever on those feature vectors. In some cases, the inputs are more complicated, like sets, distributions, functions, graphs, stochastic processes, they could be your inputs. And I want to avoid creating feature vectors from these inputs. I want to create machine learning algorithms that can operate on these complex objects as the raw inputs. For example, I want to classify sets. Okay? I want to classify functions. But I don't want to create feature vectors and then how to do that. And um, these kind of 
mutual information estimators can help you to build that. So here is just a motivated example. I have three friends, Owen, Rio, and Cristiano. It's an old data set from 2007. And I want to classify them who is good soccer player, who is bad soccer player. Okay, and I collected where they try to shoot and score goals. Owen, you can see that he tries to shoot and he's far from the goal. Rio only shoots when he's close to the goal. Cristiano, whenever he gets the ball, he shoots. Okay. <laughs> okay. So these are sets, those are the inputs, and you can label them that I don't know, good player, good player, bad player. And then the question is that if I get, give you a new set, how to predict the class label of that new set? Everyone is okay with this problem? And how would you do that? Traditionally, people, what they would do, create some feature vectors from this set, or that set, or that set, and that's your input. Or maybe calculate the mean of this guy, this set, that might be a feature vector, or the mean of that. But when you calculate these feature vectors, you lose information. So what I want to do is to create machine learning algorithms that can set, get sets as inputs and do classification of regression on those sets. And how can we solve this problem? We already know how to estimate divergences between sets or distributions. And many machine learning algorithms, what they need is actually not the original feature vectors, but just the distances between these feature vectors or the inner product between the feature vectors. What are those algorithms that only need the inner product between feature vectors? Like kernel machines, super vector machines, for example. And using these tools that I just presented, like these divergence estimators, now we can estimate the distances between these distributions and then you can use, a, say, a linear estimator classifiers. Or I can use a, we also have tools how to estimate the inner product, integral P, Q, between these uh, distributions. And then you can use your super factor machine classifiers on these um, data sets. All right, uh, just to save some time, let me skip some slides. We also use these tricks in computer vision problems. So for example, here is an image. I want to predict its class label. One thing you can do that you can break the image to image patches, like we did here. And then this image is represented as a set of image patches. And then I can use this classifier that I just built on sets. And then you might ask how it works in practice. So let me just skip some slides. And here are some results. It is a data set. It has eight categories. You can see apples and, I don't know, cow. And um, what we did that we broke the images to image patches. Each image patch had a, <coughs> then each image was a set of these image patches. And then we created this classifier that operates on um, these sets. That was called NPR, non based on, because it's called, based on non-parametric linear in mutual information estimation or non-parametric range divergence estimation. And this is the accuracy level. And we compared to many other algorithms. And uh, we got 90% classification accuracy. That was significantly better than other algorithms' classification accuracy. We also used other data sets that you can see here. And again, we got better classification accuracy than other algorithms. We also tried this uh, sport event data set, so we have eight categories. The task is that there's an image showing a sport event, and you have to predict the class label what is the sport event. And using this trick again, we got better results than other algorithms. <coughs> so sometimes breaking the original data to parts and consider the original data as a set of those parts that can lead to good classifiers. So another <clears throat> task I uh, quickly want to mention is uh, I'm also working on function-to-functional -function regression, which means that the inputs are functions and the outputs are functions as well. And you want to learn this map that maps a function to another function. 
So traditional machine learning the inputs they are finite dimensional vectors and the outputs are finite dimensional vectors. I want to generalize it to the case where the inputs are functions and the outputs are functions as well. And you can use that for many problems. So for example, you can use that to do prediction on time series. The inputs P are functions time series and the output is a other function time series Q and from P you want to predict Q. This function can be also co-occurring, like um, the P and Q happens at the same time, and again from P you want to predict Q. You can also use that for image segmentation problems. You can think of this image as a two-dimensional function, that's P, and the output is another two-dimensional function, Q. From P you want to predict Q. We also use this approach for um, in cosmology problems. Here you can see simulated universes, and uh, this is how the universe evolved. So this was, I don't know, a um, long time ago, and that was like yesterday, and you want to predict how this universe will evolve to this universe. So we developed algorithms for that, and the specific instance that I want to mention uh, now is that we generalized the Lasso algorithm to functions as well. Everyone knows Lasso, but who doesn't know Lasso? So some people don't. Uh, so in Lasso you have x1, xn features, and you have y output. In traditional regression, your goal is that you write it's xd. So you have a d-dimensional feature, and you want to predict the real output. That's the traditional regression problem. Imagine that this d is very big, and what you want to do is to select those most important features that helps you to predict y. Okay, so you want to select among d feature vectors the most important few features that helps you to predict y. That's the Lasso problem. Do a feature selection that's in your regression problem. And uh, <clears throat> we generalized that Lasso problem. So it's uh, quite often used in bioinformatics. So, for example, if I use for microarray data processing, where your goal is to find those genes, so you have the 20,000 genes, find those two few genes that are important to predict the disease. Okay. What we did is that we generalized this Lasso problem from feature vectors, where the inputs are these d-dimensional feature vectors, to functions that instead of having d feature values, we have d functions. And your goal is to select those few functions that are most important to predict um, output value. All right, so in function to your regression, your input is a function, and you want to predict the property. In um, standard regression programs on functions, what you have is that you have, say, p functions, and using these p functions, you want to predict the real output. When we generalize Lasso to this problem, but our goal is to select those few functions that are the most important to predict a real number. And what we did is, so we created an algorithm and we used that in a diffusion tensor imaging problem where each function, so in diffusion tensor imaging, in each voxel, there's a distribution function. Those were the functions. And we created an algorithm that got selected the most important functions in distribution, uh, diffusion uh, tensor imaging, the most important functions that were able to predict an output of the subjects. So here we wanted to predict the age of the subjects. And the task was to select those voxels from a DTI image that are the most important to predict the age of subjects. And uh, here are some results uh, that we got. Using our approaches, so uh, we can predict the age of subjects with mean error age plus three years. 
And when we use the competitive algorithms, that competitive algorithm was able to predict only with 12 plus 5 years accuracy. And here are the selected voxels from these DTI images that were the most important among all voxels to predict the age of the subjects. Yes? How can you compare um, this method with general projections of, on basis functions? Right, so in, when you do choose, um, so you can compare those methods, but when you do, you just use projection, what you want is that you, basically you would use all the features, it's just with the projection of those features, right? That's how you would use. It's an thing of doing a Fourier analysis. So you would have a, some basis functions with which you can represent any function as a linear combination. And then you could talk about your output function also. Ah, very good, right. So actually we do the same thing, right? Okay. So when we talk about functions, then you can represent those functions in a Fourier basis. Mm -hmm. The issue is that to represent those functions, well, you need infinite many of those business functions if you want to represent that function accurately. accurately. And then the question is that how many of those functions you need to put uh, if you want to get error less than epsilon. Okay. Okay. So indeed we use these tricks. So that's one thing. The other thing is what is the good basis function to represent my functions because depending on the different problems, you might need different functions. In some cases Fourier basis are fine. In some cases you might want to use Weber basis. Okay. Yep. Okay. And then there is again this question how to choose the right basis functions. And there's another uh, part is uh, depending on the problems. Um, this approach might not be scalable in that sense that, for example, imagine I have thousands of functions and I want to use a Gaussian process on that. In Gaussian process, you would need to create a thousand by thousand matrix and then you need to embed that matrix. So another thing we were studying is how to make it in a scalable way where you could have millions of functions and <coughs> you'll do it. Similarly with support vector machines, that those are not scalable as well because you create a gram matrix and you need to embed that gram matrix, then you can get into trouble if you have lots of objects. And uh, I'm not going to into the details now, but uh, that's the other thing we studied, is how to make it in a scalable way. All right, so why I showed this, that if you have problems where the inputs are functions, and say you have lots of functions, then you might use these tools to select the most important functions to do predictions, like how we did it, that to select the most important voxels, that each voxel was represented with a function, and uh, select the most important uh, functions to predict, say, the age of subjects. But you can try to do other predictions, like predict if a subject has a disease or not, and so on. All right. Uh, I don't have much time, so I just stop here. And the uh, bottom line is the take home message is that uh, functional data and density functionals have many important applications. So I mentioned to you how to estimate entropy, divergences, and mutual information, how to use these quantities in certain applications, such as independent <coughs> analysis, independent subspace analysis and how to generalize machine learning algorithms that operate on feature vectors to be able to operate on more complex objects such as distributions, or in the last example, how to create machine learning algorithms that can operate on fu functions as, um, <coughs> as inputs or outputs. <coughs> and uh, there are lots of missing theoretical results. Um, in many cases, we have upper bounds. We don't have lower bounds. Um, we don't know how to do active learning in this setting, and there are many more that I can discuss with you. Uh, for many of these codes are available, so if you are interested, just let me know and I can send you the uh, codes. Uh, contact me in my email address, and then I'm happy to answer uh, my questions, and thanks for your attention. I'm happy to answer two questions, yeah? In the beginning of the talk, you had mentioned about how it is hard to come estimate density, mm -hmm. and uh, you came up with uh, other estimators. Um, is it easier to estimate a CDF, or is even that also a right? So in one, we just need to estimate one-dimensional CDF. Okay. And how you do that? You have n sample points. You rank them, and you are done. Okay. 
then you sort them and then you you sort them yeah right. so you just sort them and sorting is you know if you have n points it's n I don't know, it's very and um, to con for the convergence is it faster than and the f uh, convergence is much faster obviously than, than if you plug in a density estimator to this problem uh, right, so I. Because of the k-years. Right. And the question is how to minimize these and there are, there are cost functions, right? So, what we did, for example, in independent component analysis is that uh, we need to estimate a W orthonormal matrix that minimizes my cost function after widening. And each orthonormal matrix can be decomposed as the product of so called these dotations. Uh, this is how a Gibbs rotation looks like. You choose i and j coordinates, and you put a cosine of uh, sine of uh, yeah, minus sine of uh, cosine of uh, here. These are all ones, ones, and these are all zeros. So these are called Gibbs rotation that just rotates i and j. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 I'm familiar with Yeah. And uh, we just discretize the null one. So you kind of search on this discretization. Yes, yeah. Because that's a good point that um, this is not. But there is, uh, there is a similar of 2012 mean when they average across all the days and yeah. you get the differential. Right. So that's a good point that in. You have to do that one. Yeah, so like this is he, just. He didn't cite that. <laughs> Uh, this guy, Harris? Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there, there were other papers mm -hmm. there. Uh, the there's some information on information, I see, or something, but it wasn't, the results didn't look as good. Right. Right. Your, your demos are great, mm -hmm. but again, I'm not sure how it works in practice. I'm sure there's probably some, some space loss, so it didn't start to be very good. Yeah, yeah, no, no. <laughs> How does this work? Like, you, you're working with more general metric mm -hmm. rankings, right? Right. To other mm -hmm. people who are just developers. Right. Uh, is that an advantage? That's why viewers would be better? So, or <laughs> there are so we have an extra parameter in Rainy Alpha that's alpha. And in some application, you can also choose alpha to get the best results. For example, in uh, those computer vision tasks that I showed you. We use linear alpha mutual information estimation, and you can try what kind of accuracy we get when alpha is close to one, what kind of